Why don't you all stand for the reading of God's word? Is this working? Does it sound like I'm on? A little bit? Yeah, I think so. All right, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. And be reminded as you turn there that this is God's holy word. Every single word of it is inspired by the Holy Spirit. It is inerrant and infallible. And the only final authority in everything we're supposed to believe and do. And so be addressed by God as you hear these words. Matthew 9, 9 through 13. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But When he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you that you have sent your Son. That though he was rich, he became poor for our sake to make us rich. Not in this life, Lord, but in that every spiritual blessing that you have for us. We pray, Lord, that you would humble our hearts now as we see this, as we peer into this ancient house where your son taught, that we would not peer in as the Pharisees did or as the scribes, but that we would see something of mercy that would break our hearts and make us want to imitate your son and extend that mercy outward to fill the house with all who would come. We pray that you'd write this word upon our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. The title of the message this morning is Unsavory Saving. Unsavory Saving. Uh, Hopefully this doesn't distract you. Uh, I had a little uh, ink cartridge issue uh, at the last moment, and so I've got a backup computer in case this fails as well. Uh, Anyway, I don't know if that's figuring it all out but uh, hopefully it all goes well. Um, One of the things, um, sort of role play and be a skeptic for a second, I get this question about various texts in scripture. Um, Obviously you notice here this gospel is written by Matthew who's uh, introducing himself now into the story. And one of the things you can say, if you're a skeptic, is, wait a minute. So if Matthew shows up here, how does he know what happened before? You see what I'm saying? And um, people do that about, well, if Moses wrote Genesis, well, he, but he wasn't there for the creation. I know he wasn't there for the flood either or for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and everything else. Nor was, if we stretch the skeptic's mind for a second, or maybe just even a new believer, nor is John in heaven, nor is John in the future in Revelation. He's being shown that. So just think about it that way. There may be other answers. There may be other partial answers. There's the question of chronology. Anybody that's been getting the newsletter, I've been putting those things in there about the different perspectives in the Gospels. And one commentator, in fact, it was Aquinas in his commentary, he's, he basically says, well, Matthew does things out of order sometimes, and maybe in this particular case, he followed Jesus not too long after the fishermen followed, but Matthew being a humble man, sees this as one of the miracles, namely his own conversion. And he puts that right after this man who was brought in with, you know, he's paralyzed in just a couple passages before. And he puts him right after that because he sees this in that same group of the miracles. But whatever the reasoning there, at the very least, remember, the Holy Spirit is inspiring through uh, Matthew. And so there's all sorts of scriptures like that that we can ask. So just have that in your mind. But another thing in comparing the Gospels, the calling of Matthew. It's not just here. You'll find it also in Mark. You'll find it in Luke. 
And in Mark and in Luke, they use his other name, Levi. You may notice that. And that was very common for Jews in the first century to have multiple names, sometimes more than two. But in this case, at least these two, Levi, the tax collector. Luke gives us even more help. And this gives us another view into Matthew's humility and why he may not be including some details. And there in Luke's gospel, we find in Luke 5 that the house that was the setting for this text, for this missionary meal into the heart of sin central, which is what this is, this house is nothing other than, guess whose house? It's Matthew's. Matthew doesn't tell you that. But Luke does. Luke 5, 29, Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. In other words, Matthew has friends in low places. He wasn't just a sinner himself. He knew lots of them. I say low. I say that in a moral sense. The reality is Matthew was probably rolling in the dough. Because as a tax collector, someone especially on the Sea of Galilee as a customs agent, they were extorting money, taking money off the top, not only for the Romans and the temple tax and things like that, but also for their own pockets. And so he likely profited from the taxes on industries like the fishermen. And so the animosity that you see, you know, sometimes, well, not sometimes, a lot of times Jesus movies get things very inaccurate and they take licenses. But I think one of the things that you see, the animosity between Matthew and the fishermen, especially Peter, I think that's not far off the mark. Well, here's the big idea that we're supposed to get out of this passage today. Jesus calls us from unrighteousness and self-righteousness and to gather more of the lowly for the same. Let me say that again. Jesus calls us all from unrighteousness and from self-righteousness and to gather more of the lowly for the same. And we'll see that in three ways. Number one, we'll see the king's call to the unrighteous. We'll see, secondly, the king's call to the self-righteous. And then third, the king's call for both to repent. Because this text especially, you can see different ways that it can be preached and to have an imbalance there. But he is calling all of us to repent. Let's first look at the king's call to the unrighteous. There's two other times where we encounter a tax collector in the Gospels. And you may know the stories. Zacchaeus in Luke's Gospel. And then also in Luke, the man in the parable of the uh, Pharisee and the tax collector. And what's unique here is that the tax collector gets to tell the story, Matthew. And notice what he remembers in verse 9 as he recounts the moments that changed his life forever. Here's what he remembers. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew. Yes, he refers to himself in the third person. That's what you do. You're not writing an autobiography. It's not really even a biography of Jesus. The Gospels are a very unique kind of literature. The attention is not on himself. So a man called Matthew, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. Three things, three observations really quickly. First, Jesus took the initiative. He's the one who saw and called. John 15, he tells the disciples, without me you can do nothing. James 1.18 says, of his own will he brought us forth. And so faith comes by hearing, Romans 10, 17, and hearing through the word of Christ. So Jesus is the one who saw and called. Secondly, he found him in the place of his treason. He found him in the place of his sin. He did not wait for him to clean himself up. That's not the way Matthew recounts it. Tax collectors were despised by Jews for this very reason. They served the Romans in extortion of the Jews. And so this setting is perfect in a sense. Jesus sees him in the place of his treason against God's people. Third, the call of Christ did the same for this tax collector as it did to the fishermen brothers. It's immediately rising and following. It's the same sort of imagery with Peter and Andrew and John and James. Immediately they left their nets. Immediately they got out of the boat and they followed him. God seeks us. God sees us in our sin. 
And he calls us anyway. While we were enemies of God, Romans 5 10 says. It says that in three different ways there. While we were helpless, while we were weak, while we were enemies of God, Christ died for us. In 1 Peter 1.3, he has caused us to be born again. And so that's the way Matthew sees it, as the sovereign seeking Savior that changes Matthew's life. Both Matthew and his acquaintances are all in the category of sinners, and that's really where the focus shifts here at this point. Before Jesus ever tells the parable of the wedding feast that we'll run into later in this gospel, and before he issues that command in that parable to fill up the king's wedding hall, to make much of Jesus by inviting everyone to celebrate Jesus, before he ever does this, this traitor to God's people, Matthew, becomes the first disciple to obey this command. Think of it this way. Read this getting up and following and filling up Matthew's house in light of the parable of the wedding feast. Matthew obeys this summons before anybody else obeys this summons. He fills up the hole for Jesus. But who do he fill it with? Only one kind of person. Sinners. Unrighteous. Ungodly. People say that to me all the time. I can't come to Jesus. I've done this. I've done that. So you're a sinner. Yes, but I've sinned big. So you're ungodly. Well, Romans 4, 5 says, And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteous. You're a perfect candidate for this. You're unqualified. You're no good. You're unrighteous. You're not worthy of God, just like the prodigal son, just like me. You're the perfect candidate. Charles Spurgeon had a wonderful plea to all of his hearers about this verse in a collection of sermons called All of Grace. He says about Romans 4, 5, and we can... You know, we can put that on this text as well. He says, if God justifieth the ungodly, then he can justify you. Is not the, that the very kind of person that you are? If you are unconverted at this moment, it is a very proper description of you. If you feel that you are spiritually sick, the physician has come into the world for you. If you are altogether undone by reason of your sin, you are the very person aimed at by this salvation. So there's a very intentional group of people that are brought in here for Jesus to forgive. The twice-used phrase tax collectors and sinners in this passage emphasizes that this kind is the most despised kind of sinner. He could have brought anybody into the room and they would have needed Jesus. They would have been a sinner. They would have needed forgiveness. But he wants to bring in these people that are notorious sinners. Traitors. Wicked. Not just ungodly in God's eyes, but unsavory in our eyes. And it adds many, many sinners. At the end of one of the kingdom parables later in the gospel, in chapter 21, there's a repetition of the phrase tax collectors and prostitutes. So whenever that phrase is used, sinners in this sense, in Matthew's gospel, he's using it very particular to talk about the worst of the worst, and oftentimes that's the way the Jews would talk about the wicked or the sinners. And if nothing else, this indicates to us the level of society the tax collectors were in Israel. But as Hendrickson comments in his commentary, Matthew had caught the master's spirit here. He knew that it was to seek and save sinners, definitely including publicans, tax collectors that Jesus had come to dwell among men. So what Hendrickson's saying, and what we want to say by this first point that he's calling the unrighteous, is that Matthew is tracking with Jesus at this point better than any of the other disciples. He is filling up the hall with the worst of the worst. Well, if that's the king's call to the unrighteous, he also calls to the self-righteous. Anybody new to the Bible might find its way of speaking very odd sometimes. But if you look at Matthew's, and Matthew likes this word, and a lot of biblical authors do, but the word idu in the Greek means behold. Or see, we don't use that anymore. We don't, we don't say behold. You know, it's very traumatic. We would never speak like that. We would say, you know, like, check it out or something like that. But the idea here is look, look. 
It's an attention-getting beginning of a sentence. And so Matthew's right in the middle of his story. He moves from his tax booth to his house. And in the middle of it, just when we're ready to fall asleep, just when we're ready to doze off moving from left to right in our Bibles and just looking at the black and white and the details, yada, 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 Matthew snaps us back into it and says, Behold, oh, I want you to see something here. And so he's moving us from the black and white to full color and panorama. What does he want us to notice? Notice in this ancient festive meal, two things. Number one, the sordid characters that are dining with Jesus. But secondly, there's another group that's here. And this is a group that would not have to be told by Matthew, Behold! They wouldn't have to be told to notice anything. In fact, they were professional noticers. It's what they did. It was on their job description. These were the spec checkers that I mentioned back in chapter 7. These are the people that notice, the spiritual TSA agents, I think I called them back then. These are the noticers, and they're peering in. They're looking at when the Pharisees saw this. Now, we don't have the details. Were they, were they looking in the gates? Were they looking into the windows? Could they even see? Uh, this is an ancient home, and they didn't have all of our Western, you know, hang-ups about privacy. They could, it could have been like a backyard. We would call it a barbecue, but it could have been so many people that it could have been in a courtyard. Matthew doesn't give us the details, but whatever it was, the Pharisees were observing. They were seeing this, and they said in verse 11, when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners. When you run up to, into that in the Gospels, that's not, that's not a curiosity. That's not them just wondering something. Now tell me more about this Jesus guy. This is an accusation. This is dripping with accusation. In other words, it's almost like Simon at his house when the woman, who was an immoral woman, had her hair on Jesus. She was worshiping. And what did Jesus read his mind and what was he thinking? If this man was really a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is. This is an accusation. This is the tone that we're always to read this in. And notice that Jesus combines the medical imagery with the legal imagery yet again. The great physician here doesn't just make house calls. He makes the house calls. He initiates. He seeks the sick to heal. So here's his response. Here's what the Pharisees didn't get. Here's what we could be in danger of not getting as we're in a modern church and maybe looking at this corner and that corner and say, why are they sitting there? Why is he here at all? Oh, look at that guy. He'll never be in church or whatever it is. Here's what we don't get. But when he heard it, he said, those who are well, have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Jesus was very biting sometimes. Whether it's, you want to call it sarcasm or whatever else. But he threw some, some hard edges back at the Pharisees oftentimes. Go and learn what this means, that, that expression. You experts in the law. Got a homework assignment for you. You missed a spot. That's how Jesus is speaking here as he cites this Old Testament passage. Go and learn. I'll, I'll answer you, but first I've got a homework assignment for you. Go along because I'm about to school you. That's the tone we're to read this in. Go and learn what this means first, and then we'll talk. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Now he's quoting from Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. And there, Israel is an immoral woman. And the whole flavor of that book carries that out. But the word that he uses for mercy there in the Hebrew, chesed, is a word that can mean covenant faithfulness or steadfast love. And oftentimes it is translated compassion or mercy. But Jesus is saying, go and learn what this means. The Son of God here in this room that you're peering into is sticking to the plan of salvation. He has covenant faithfulness. He has steadfast love, whereas his critics see only the outer shell of religion. But this is what God desires. 
steadfast love to save. Luke 19.10 says that the Son of Man came to seek and save what is lost. That's what he came for. He came on a, 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 a seeking and rescuing mission. And so what's the first takeaway for the self-righteous? The first lesson is that they are not in a fundamentally different category than the unrighteous. Really, we could put it like this, and maybe we should. There's this division between the unrighteous and the self-righteous. We should call it a division between the consciously unrighteous and the unconsciously unrighteous. In other words, those who know that they are unrighteous and those who are also unrighteous but do not know it. They are deluded. They are not poor in spirit, as Jesus mentioned in the Beatitudes. That's the first takeaway. But the second takeaway is simply stop. Go and learn what this means first. Stop stopping the patients from seeing the great physician. So much legalism in the church for I don't know how long, maybe as long as the church has been the church, going back to Galatia. It's not just a private legalism that I bind myself up in things to do so that God will love me. But there's so much of a corporate legalism that is always peering into the churches that we're in, that we're members of, and, and, and staring dumbfounded that Jesus would bring in these people, that there'd be all this motion and all this saving and restoring lives. And so Jesus is really saying, stop piling up religious paperwork and performance hoops and hurdles that the spiritually poor have to jump through. Like they were your trained seals in order to earn the right to come to church. And if you read on in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 23 when he launches out these woes against the Pharisees, so much of it is not just that the Pharisees were offending God by their legalism, but they were stopping the spiritually poor. They were stopping people that did not have all of their advantages, maybe didn't have the background in the law that they had, whatever it is, from obeying God, from coming in to the church. But the third takeaway sums up the other two, mercy. And that may be the ultimate takeaway at the heart of this passage. Jesus as the judge who comes down from the bench and Jesus the physician who comes to one's house. It's one Jesus. And in both coming downs, it's mercy. It's mercy on the move. This is the heart of God. This is what we're seeing. This is the king, and therefore this is what his kingdom is like. If you, if you want to like his kingdom, this is what you'd better like. We'd better like being on this ministry of mercy. But here's our problem. There's something very unsavory about that. There's something very uncomfortable about that. There's something dirty about that. The whole idea implies guilt and even shame. You wouldn't need mercy if you had it all together. And if you had too much of the illusion that you did have it all together, well, then you might just miss mercy altogether. In fact, you might just be annoyed at those who are so lowly that they're always reminding you of your own need for mercy. James addresses this in his letter in the distinctions that we so often make. You know, a lot of the ways that we treat other people as an indication of how we love God or don't love God. Um, a lot of the way that we treat people and look down on people is an indication of how we think we get right with God. The parable of the tax collector and the Pharisee in Luke 18 starts that way. Luke makes the point before Jesus tells the parable that he told this parable to those who trusted in themselves and treated others with contempt. There's a connection. If we think we're so great before God, we're probably going to lift ourselves above other people. So James tells us this in James 2, verse 2 through 5. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become Judges with evil thoughts. Listen, my beloved brothers. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world 
to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him. So how we treat other people and how we open up the church and want to extend mercy is an indication of whether or not we have tasted mercy ourselves. That brings up the third point here, because the king is calling the unrighteous, the king is calling the self-righteous, but thirdly, the king's call is for both to repent. We want to avoid two extremes here. When Jesus says at the end in verse 13, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. He's talking to the Pharisees. This is part of his response to them, but this is not a compliment to the Pharisees. He's not saying to the Pharisees, you know, no, I wasn't, this, is, this meal isn't for you. You're good to go. You guys aren't sinners. You guys aren't sick. It's not really a problem. You already submitted your class assignment. This is just like sinner summer school for the real stragglers. You're okay. And that's not what he means by, I did not come to call the righteous. He wasn't calling them righteous. He wasn't calling them well. No, it was more like he was saying, I have nothing to say to you. My Father has not sent me to you. You're not invited. There are the unrighteous, but then there are the self-righteous. But as I said, they're both unrighteous. And so in a sense, he is saying to us all, you are invited if you lose the attitude. Drop the God complex. That's what he's saying to the Pharisees. And you too can be poor in spirit because that's the only attitude of heart in my kingdom. Now, as I said, there's opposite extremes here. The whole flavor of this passage is, and I, I, think, many, I think many sermons have been tailored uh, for this passage or the Mark's version or Luke's version uh, on the title, Jesus, Friend of Sinners, or something to that effect. And that's absolutely true, and thank God for that. But it is a common error to go to the other extreme than the Pharisees, especially in the age of the seeker-friendly church. To take from this passage the kind of mantras that I've seen on church leaflets everywhere. Come as you are. Well, I don't know how else to come to church, but, or I am, but what do they mean by that? Leave as you are. It's cool. Belong, then believe. What are they getting at? In a sense, that would be true of them. They they didn't know everything there, and Jesus was opening things up to them, and they belonged. But what's the idea being communicated there? We don't want to commit the opposite error to the error of self-righteousness, and that is the error of no righteousness. There's a technical term for it, antinomianism, being against law. Sometimes we call it easy believism where we set the bar of God's holiness to nowhere. What's God's holiness? We don't talk about it, and we don't talk about sin. And so that's the opposite error, that Jesus was a friend of sinners indiscriminately without a care to saying, go and sin no more. And so that's the opposite error. Jesus is calling both the consciously unrighteous and the unconsciously unrighteous, the self-righteous, he is calling them both to repentance. So we can see that being rich, for example, or religiously having your act together, those don't save you, and that's pride. Well, that's true, but poverty is not a virtue by which you're saved either. Poor people need a savior. Rich people need a savior. Prideful people need a savior in their religious works, and people that wouldn't really step foot in a church because they're they're pagans and and they're totally okay with that. Guess what? They need to be saved too. The message here is not Jesus saying, if you're a tax collector, prostitute, or any of those things, you just pass go, you're fine. And that's the way oftentimes that this is interpreted, that you don't need to change, that you don't need to repent, that God is not going to do something fundamentally different with you as a sinner. But that's not true. Both The unrighteous and self-righteousness need to come to Christ's righteousness. That he would be our righteousness, 1 Corinthians 1.30. And that implies a call to repent from every sin involved. And we've already heard that quite a few ways in Matthew's gospel already. Jesus said a few things that will not allow for the slightest bit of license 
the slightest bit of just, you know, being a sinner and Jesus is just chummy with that. No, Matthew 3, 2, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's part of our gospel call. That better be on our leaflets if we have leaflets. Repent. Matthew 4, 17, from that time Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 5, 20, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 6, 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Matthew 7, 23, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Being a sinner makes you a perfect candidate for grace. So don't be a legalist. Yes, come as you are and receive forgiveness. But being a sinner is also not a virtue either. It's not neutral. That needs to change. And Christ comes to us to change that. And so if the Pharisees had reason to stand back in fear, guess who else did? Every single one of these house guests. Did they come presumptuously to Jesus? They did. Not here to tell you that Matthew got everything right in his own life at that time, just because the Holy Spirit is speaking through him in this gospel. And this picture is right. But of course, they were just starting. They didn't know who they were sitting next to, not really. Were they just fine coming as they were, belonging, and then worrying about what to believe about Jesus later on? No, that would have been a terrible, terrible error. Both they who are legalists who stood aghast at their presence, and these notorious sinners both had great reason to be alarmed at the presence of the Holy One who was in their midst. Now let's apply this to our lives. First of all, this is an encouragement to us. This is a summons to us. As Matthew was called to repent, there's a call to repentance and following Jesus. And it's a call to forsake all earthly treasure. We saw it already with the fishermen and what they were doing and what they counted as a meaningful life. But we see it in Matthew, too. Because, as I said, Matthew's tax booth was his place of treason. But it was also his place of treasure. It was how he made his money. It was what he expected to do for the rest of his life. It's his place of security. The Romans would hook him up if the Jews ever turned on him. And we all have things like that in life that we think will last forever that we think are permanent, that we think are secure and safe. And Luke's account adds the words in chapter 5, verse 28, and leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And leaving everything. Again, we see Matthew's humility. He doesn't stress the fact that he left everything, lest you think that it was some great sacrifice on his part that he wanted to draw your attention to. But Luke does draw attention to it because, in fact, we are called to leave everything. Everything. Another translation says, he forsook all. Have we done that? In coming to Christ, have we forsaken all? I'm not talking about living like a hermit. We've already covered that. God calls us into things in this world to use our gifts and our talents to be stewards of things that he's given us. I'm not talking about that. But are we prepared to leave anything behind that keeps us from following hard after Christ? Is there anything in our lives that is functioning for us like chains that's holding us back? A treasure, a security, a something that says, well, I'll come to Christ later, or I'm, I've already come to Christ, but I'm not going to live. I'll live for him later. I've got to get my ducks in a row first. Your ducks will never be in a row. Your ducks are going to get all messed up in this world if you follow Christ. There'll never be a perfect time. But Matthew left everything. But this passage is finally meant for our consolation. This is gospel. What the Pharisees failed to understand about Jesus, supposedly, you know, the Pharisees looked at this and said, what a downgrade. I mean, if you're really who you claim to be, you're consorting with these sinners. I thought you were going to be a king. I thought you were going to have a kingdom. You're going to start with these people. Come on. It starts with fishermen, tax collectors, prostitutes, all these different things. That's how you're going to start a kingdom? But what the Pharisees didn't understand is they think that that's such a big downgrade for an earthly king. Well, it is for an earthly king. But there was no bigger downgrade. If you want to talk about downgrades and the incarnation itself. For God to save sinners at all. 
He who is holy and undefiled and dwells in inapproachable light, as Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, would be saving, would be getting near those who are infinitely unworthy and corrupt. Well, what does Paul say about this? In 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, I prayed this at the beginning because this verse reminds me of this. He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. It's not talking about physical dough there. It's talking about something much more glorious. Though he was God and in the very form of God, he says in Philippians 2, that's the way he puts it there. Yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. For the self-righteous, a righteous man getting too close to the unrighteous makes absolutely no sense at all. But what we see from this text today is that it had better start making sense to us. Because that downgrade is the only hope we have. In the gospel, we have the only righteous one ever. Not only sitting next to the unrighteous and scandalizing himself by becoming too close to them, but of changing places with the unrighteous. The righteous for the unrighteous, 1 Peter 3, 18 says, that he might bring us to God. There's something scandalous about salvation. There's something unsavory about this salvation, but there had to be. It's the only kind of salvation that would work. The only salvation that would save sinners is if one who is God came down in the likeness of sinful flesh, Paul says in Romans 8, that he made him to be sin, 2 Corinthians 5.21. As Spurgeon said in that little paragraph I read about the ungodly, if God justifieth the ungodly, that he can justify you. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would, by your Holy Spirit, grip us with such a mercy that is scandalous to the eyes of the flesh, but is the only hope we have. And we thank you, Lord, that it is hope enough. We thank you for this mercy that would come down to people as terrible as us. We can only see the outside of other people, but you see the depths of our heart. If we were to peer into the vilest sinner in our imagination who does not deserve your mercy, we could only see the surface. And there in the depths of our own heart, as you tell us in Jeremiah, the heart is desperately sick. Who can understand it? And we can't, and we know that you can. And yet, you had mercy. Lord, grip our hearts with that today. Show us how your grace is amazing. Show us that we all can say what Paul said, that of all sinners we are the foremost. We thank you for this mercy, Lord. We pray that we would live in light of it now. In Jesus' name, amen.